the Social Talent Show. We are focused today on employer branding, why companies need it, and why employees want it, and much, much more. My name is Crystal Mess. I'm the producer of the show, as well as the head of marketing for Upmo, and I will be your moderator today. So if you're a first-time viewer or listener, let me introduce you briefly to the Social Talent Show. Uh, the show is a thought leadership series developed by Upmo and Talent Culture, designed to showcase radical thinkers on the topics of talent collaboration, talent mobility, HR, and social talent. We'll be hosting the Social Talent Show every second and fourth Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m., 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, with a new thought leader every, every show. You can also check out all the previous episodes on our website, socialtalentshow.com. Um, all the previous shows um, include um, exciting topics such as the future of social HR and the talent management and leveraging the social graph in the enterprise, which was last week with Bennett Resnick. We'll introduce um, today's guest in just a minute, but before we start, I wanted to thank you so much for joining. So as part of the regular show, I'd like to introduce you to our host. First up, we have Rob Garcia, VP of Product at Upmo. Rob's a disruptor and innovator from Silicon Valley who's been building e-commerce, financial, and consumer-oriented web and social products for over 12 years. He's a leading voice in the startup community, blogging, tweeting, mentoring, and speaking passionately about disruptive innovation, and more recently about social collaboration, career, and talent management. Rob, say hello. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Disruptor sounds like a bad word to me, but uh, I guess I am. I guess I'm a little bit of a troublemaker, so I'm um, really looking forward to the show today. Great. So we also have Megan Ambiro, founder of Talent Culture and T-Chat, the popular Twitter conversation about talent culture, future of work, and the intersection of social media, recruiting, and HR. Megan is also a member of the National Association of Personnel Services, the Society of Human Resources Management, and several entrepreneurial organizations. Her thoughts are often quoted on top publications such as Forbes, CBS Money Watch, Glassdoor, Monster, and the HR publication of your choice. Megan, please say hello. Hello, or should I say tweet tweet out there in the world of work universe. It's Megan M. Biro here, and uh, I'm really excited to have this show today. We're talking about how to get ahead in the talent war, and, and we are going to bring up that, that term called employer branding, and i um, really excited to be here again. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks, Megan. So just a couple uh, housekeeping items before we start up. So all participants, as you may have noticed, are muted throughout the duration of the show. However, we'll be taking questions via the chat feature or via live Twitter stream. So feel free to use the hashtag eChat pretty liberally this morning. We'll also be picking up questions as they pertain to the conversation. So if you throw those out over Twitter, we'll pick those up as well. Um, the webinar will be recorded, and its slides, video, and podcast will be available to you at socialtalentshow.com tomorrow. So please check that out and go ahead and tweet that when you um, see that it's available. Um, so the show today will be about 30 minutes long, and we'll open it up for about 10 or 15 minutes of questions. So just sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy the conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rob and Megan. Cool. So let me introduce you real quick here. Um, well, first let's start with the, 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 the topic. I think the topic is really fascinating. Um, i got to be honest with you. I've been, in, I've been doing uh, product marketing and product management, management for the longest time, all kinds of different clients, and branding and identity has always been very close and dear to me, especially when it comes to creating products that are disruptive and, in, and, uh, and innovative. But I never really thought about branding and identity as part of, of, of an employer uh, or recruiting. So this is really interesting to me. It's kind of a new concept to me. I've been hearing, reading about it. I've been following and harassing and stalking uh, <laughs> Libby, uh, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes. But I think it's, uh, you know, let's just go through this real quick. It's thinking more like a consumer when it comes to work, establishing a team at the top. And, and, and at the top, maybe we'll, we'll, talk what that, we'll, we'll talk about what that means. With, with, that, with those marketing communications and business operations uh, expertise, right? Uh, and considering both the needs, not only of the business, but also the worker. And that's when it becomes employee-centric, and that's why I get excited about this. Uh, at the end of the day, it's becoming an organization that creates strong connection with anybody out there, not just your existing employees, but potential employees in the future. Who knows who's going to come down in your, uh, in your uh, talent pool or talent stream at some point? You want to have that, not only your consumer brand, but also your employer brand 
uh, out there so that people understand uh, and, and want to work with you. Um, hey, Rob, those are great thoughts. And I just wanted to chime in. It's Megan here. The key point in terms of the, the all the HR and recruiting practitioners out there is very often what I've found in the years of, of doing what I do on the practitioner side is leaders believe a company's brand is just a marketing tool. And it doesn't have to do with the people working for the actual company, and it's just the opposite. You know, the very best talent out there is going to be attracted to your business because of your humanized, appealing brand, you know, and it's the image it conveys to the, the rest of the world. And your employees will want to stay and give their absolute best to the workplace culture because they feel that the brand is actually a person. And that's what we're really talking about here today, so it's exciting. Yes, that's right. All right, so let me introduce Libby real quick, and then we, we'll give her the, the floor. Um, so Libby, I met you, what, back in January? I've been following before that, but I met you in January in Austin. Uh, lovely, lovely lady. She has, I would say she's probably the undeniable expert on this topic. So we're really excited to have her. Um, let me just kind of quickly walk through what she, what she brings to the table. She, she has 30 years of expertise as a business advisor and as a board member and as a CHRO. And actually somebody tweeted to me yesterday, what do you mean by CHRO? Uh, so I guess we, we'll spell it out. Most people might not know what it means. But at least we're on the space. We know what it means. But that's uh, that's the chief HR officer. So that's the person who really partners with the CEO to drive the company talent and to keep the best talent in the company. So and she she's played that role in two very um, well known companies like Yahoo and uh, Southwest Airlines. So she I'm sure she'll mention a couple of things uh, uh, as we talk. Um, I love your story about the yacht alert. I know you might not have time to go through that, uh, but it's a fun, fun story. Um, and then uh, she also she also was listed as um, Fortune 100, 500 best companies to work for while she was at these companies. So she definitely was the, the, the force and the strength behind the employer brand that, that those companies represented at that point. Um, and right now she's been focusing on helping companies grow. Um, and develop employment brand strategies. So let's just we'll jump right in and have uh, Libby take the floor. Libby, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here, and um, I really appreciate all your accolades. Uh, I think one of the funny things that happened to me after I left my 30-year corporate life and decided to sort of go out on my own and do my own thing is people started uh, talking about me as a thought leader, and I was always trying to think, where am I going to get these thoughts? Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, uh, I try to be places and talk to interesting people. And I don't know if I'm a disruptor, but I love to find disruptors and hear from them. And I think one of the most fun events to do that at is here in the Austin area. It's called South by Southwest. And uh, that's where I've uh, met many, many interesting people that are sort of paving the new world of work. So I'll start. Yep a little bit uh, briefly by um, going forward with um, where uh, HR has been and where it's going. Rob, I am pushing the uh, advance of slides, and it's not advancing. Oh, yeah. Sorry to tell you. Let me, sure, let me make sure you have, yeah, you have, um, you have power. You have overall power on the keyboard and mouse. You should be able to click on it. Are we having fun yet or what? <laughs> if it will go wrong, it does, right? Uh, there we go. Well, Are you hey, that, <laughs> no worries. That, we're just we're here to have fun me? today. All right. So, Rob, did you push it or did that change from me? Uh, I didn't do anything. Okay. All right. So maybe it's working now. It's just slow. So HR, when I first started in the field, was literally called personnel administration. And over my 30-year career in HR, obviously, we moved from administration to management to the C-suite, hence the um, Chief Human Resource Officer title. And I am um, among uh, the fortunate few, maybe 30 or so um, HR leaders who actually serve on boards of directors. I serve on the board of the director of a Fortune 500 company. And that is a rarity but um, it is happening more and more. So HR itself is evolving into 
the executive suite. But as we evolve, I think our role has evolved, and I see a very great intersection between the world of HR and marketing. And my thoughts this, along this way have come from um, the work that I discovered in employer branding through Southwest Airlines. Sorry to tell you, but Rob, maybe you should drive the slides because when I'm hitting it, nothing's happening. That's okay. You know what I feel like, Libby? You've got so <laughs> many stories that you can tell <laughs> from your career that you don't even need a slide, do you? I mean, who no, needs slides when I we can, can talk about humanizing brands and you're doing it? Okay, well, I can go without the slides uh, very easily, and uh, I was just going to kind of set the stage. Yeah. But I think, Rob, when, I've got, when I'm ready for the next slide, I'll just say next slide, and we'll see how it works. Work yeah. itself during the same period has evolved tremendously. And when we think about work, you know, we started, you know, all out on the family farm, moved through the Industrial Revolution uh, to technology, to what we used to call... Um, the knowledge business, the creative work, and I think where we are now, um, Manpower, one of the companies that I uh, serve on the board with, has coined the term, and I think it is a fantastic term, the human age, which really means people are really the, the product in a way. We're in the driver's seat, and it, rather than being about the company or the organization like it used to be um, 30 years ago, it is really about the talent inside the organization. The next um, four slides I'm going to go through really quickly. And um, Rob, you can just push one right after the other, because they're all examples of even a new way to work that's not even out there um, where you even know the people that work for you, for example. On um, Mechanical Turk, it's an Amazon product where people can hire people to do jobs from home. And they're usually things like filling out a spreadsheet um, or those kinds of uh, human intelligence tasks. Or their top coder on the next slide, which employs um, right now over 300,000 coders and has contests that has prizes for the coders who um, are coding. Or GigWalk, which is literally an iPhone app that uh, allows people to do micro tasks and get paid for them, or tasks such as um, collect collecting business information, taking pictures of billboards, uh, secret shopping, all kinds of things. Um, that's run by one of my former colleagues at, at Yahoo. And then another example is Task Rabbit on the next slide, which um, is where you can just hire people to come do things like Assemble your IKEA furniture, which is a big need. I know if any of you all have opened up uh, that box. Well, tell me about it. Anyone else out there love IKEA? I do. Let's tweet it. The point of that, though, is that um, the on the next slide, thinking about talent, sort of like we thought about the cloud um, a few years ago. Uh, there's going to be a certain amount of talent out there that is going to be available to be used only when needed. So if you think about IT, we used to have to buy mainframes and run our own shops and spend a lot of money on uh, real estate to use our um, computing power. And now we use the cloud, and we just use what we need when we need it. That's a new com coming um, trend with talent, too. Yeah, at the same time, let's move on to the people who actually do the work. I don't call them employees anymore. Next slide. Yeah. Um, I call them Actually, workers. that's really interesting. I want to yeah. interrupt you there for a second because I have a couple of thoughts. You, you just given us so much, so much um, stuff here to think about. So the first, you, you talked a little bit about the evolution of, of HR, and you came back to the human era uh, as like this is the era we're in right now. But wasn't wasn't that the beginning of HR? I mean, I remember my dad spend 20 years with the same company because he loved the people he worked for and he knew that the company had his back when something was wrong. And I kind of asked him that, uh, two weeks ago as I was preparing for this thing, I asked him, so why do you stay so long with, the, with that company? He said, because I knew if I had an accident, I knew if I had a problem, I knew if I had a family situation I could leave, and I knew that I had my job when I came back because I knew the people at a personal level. 
Uh, and also, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, pensions and stuff like that. But, but that's a human connection. That's what human resources was about. So w what happened in the middle? We went into this. I don't know if you have enough time. Yeah, Rob. I, I know, really. I mean, Rob, we only oh, have so much time. But I will tell you that what happened is it was all about the organization back then. The contrast now is we organizations are all competing um, in a stock market if we're publicly traded or amongst our competitors to deliver results very quickly. The innovations and disruptions that are hitting our businesses are coming more and more quickly. If you're in a business like I was at uh, Yahoo, the technology and what you're working on is changing uh, year after year, and there's always a competitor who reinvents it better than you or invents something that you never thought of. And so what happens is we used to, if we were just manufacturing widgets, we were able to say, here's how many people we need to manufacture widgets, and we'll have them for the next 20 years, and we want to keep them happy. But now we might be. Um, creating the technology for widgets today and doing something completely different tomorrow. And so we now um, need to have different workers. And we can't really promise someone lifetime employment. We can't really promise them career development. You know, one of, one of the lines that was the most popular line when I joined the workforce in 1977 was, join us and build your, build your career here. We have a lot of opportunities. So back to the slide where I am, this has created a huge amount of disgruntled, dissatisfied, disengaged, skeptical, cynical workers. Um, many who are sitting in their jobs right now, 75% of the people working, are not really uh, finding their jobs to be interesting. They're not satisfied with what they're making. We can move on to the next slide. And so we have this um, situation where we have a person who has grown up in this age that is unhappy with their, what they're doing because of the economy who has so many talents and skills. And so this is where I would really look at the worker as a completely different person before. You know, back when your dad, Rob, went to work, he probably found his job by looking at a one ad in the paper. And he typed out a resume on a... Um, IBM's electric typewriter, and he put, made sure he had the right font and the right stationery, and he sent it in the mail, and he waited two or three weeks before they called him back. I mean, think of the world in which he went to work versus the world that we go to work in now. Um, right now, I don't think a job description or one ad is going to excite any of the top talent that you want to recruit. And if you're a worker out there looking at your career, I'm sure you're not real excited about reading a job description. That doesn't turn you on, does it? Hey, Libby, no, so, no. Megan here. I, I, can I interrupt you for just a sec? Sure. I, I have a question. I've spent most of my career in the high-tech industry with software companies working on recruiting and talent strategy. Um, I always had this thought that the big tech companies understood very excuse me, early about sort of the talent war and some of the, you know, the emergence of the personal brand and, and, and some of these other terms that, you know, God knows I've been, I've been blogging about for years at this point. Do you, did you see any difference or do you to date see any difference between, say, a Yahoo and a Southwest Airlines? You know, a product company that's in the airline business versus a product company that's in high tech. Any trends out there that you're seeing regarding companies um, adapting to this idea of brand humanization in social media? And is there well, any differences? I think there's a lot of a difference, um, but there are many similarities too. Southwest, at least for the foreseeable future, is in the same business. We, you know, we are, we, we used to say we're not in the airline business, we're in the customer service business, but we basically yep. flew people from A, from A to point B with excellent customer service. And that, you know, we used to say if one day, um, you know, rocket travel is invented or a high-speed rail becomes a mode of transportation, we might get into that business, so we don't want to think of ourselves as always being in one business, but... It's a lot easier to brand and to create this commitment and this engaged workforce when you can say to people, 
we plan to be in this business for the foreseeable future, and we're growing. So if you think mm -hmm. of something like like Yahoo, um, I mean Yahoo, we got we sort of not that we invented the internet like Al Gore, but we were <laughs> internet uh, pioneers, and um, we started search, but we couldn't figure out how to monetize it. So here comes Google and Overture around and figure out how to monetize something that mm -hmm. we couldn't figure out how to do. And we had a lot of social media tools, but we didn't invent Facebook. And all of those businesses disrupted us and uh, have caused the company to have to rethink their business model and um, sadly, um, you know, trim their workforce significantly over the last few years since I've left the company. So um, it's very hard to create an engaged, branded employment experience with that much movement and change going on. Um, right. But that's why I say we need to think about how we even appeal to people different. I don't think mm -hmm. that we should say to people, come work for us and build your career here. I think so a Yahoo should say. Let me ask you a question. Sure. So are, are, the, are the two trends that you're referring to basically crowdsourcing and micro specialization, if I can say that correctly, uh, in, in a world where people are not happy at, work, at, jo at their jobs, uh, are they micro specializing in something that they that they care about, they they want to do, and are they now on demand and being sourced through some of the tools that, that you just mentioned, like TaskRabbit and um, uh, yeah, I think a lot of things have led. I think a lot of things have led to it. The technology is finally there that we can find these people when we need them. I think there's been a lot of people who have, for whatever reason, lost lost their jobs or don't like their jobs and quit. Um, I think one of the most innovative ones that I have run into at South by Southwest was this whole issue of co-working, where people have set up these co-working centers in different cities, and a lot of web designers and marketers and um, coders kind of meet there and collaborate on projects. But my point about all of those things is, that we used to be competing against each other in a marketplace where we were looking for employees to come to work for a job and spend a career. Now we're competing against a whole different way to work. And we may not even be just competing against each other. We may be competing against uh, people who can do whatever they want. So we need to think of the people who work for us the same way we think of consumers. Uh, when we're marketing our product. And we need to think about the product that we are providing to these consumers is the experience of working with our company and connecting with our brand while building their own personal brand. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's the competition is not just geography and, and location and, and the town that your company is at. It's, your talent pool is bigger than that because technology enables that. It basically lowers those barriers and, and makes the it's kind of like globalization of talent almost. Yeah, exactly. And I would go out on a limb and say that you know medium to large size corporations are going to have a much more tricky time trying to do this. I mean, a lot of my client base are software startups that tend to be nimble. They can move on a dime, and you know they've got. 50 employees that they're trying to get together around a message, that's a whole lot more easy than, you know, your Fortune 500 company that you're trying to turn around and get all, you know, marketing and recruiting and HR speaking to each other, you know? You also look at just the, the, the raw size of a company and how what, what the headcount is and, and how challenging that's going to be in terms of employment branding. I think that's, that's another, you know, just another angle to, to think about. Well, I think the biggest game changer in the market um, is was really Google, and they came along and really disrupted what right. we were doing at Yahoo. But they did some of the coolest branding. They didn't advertise their product. The branding they started out with was basically appealing to, and it was more like a brand campaign than branding. But they were appealing to the best and the brightest of the tech world, and what they basically right. told their people is, you're really smart, you got a straight A, you went to the best school, join us and we'll figure out something for you to do. And um, what they have done very, very well, 
I think, is they have recognized that the new generation of these very sharp, talented workers are not going to be happy doing the same thing day after day and year after year, and they're not going to stay there 20 years unless they have the opportunity to move from project to project and product to product and even bring their own product ideas into the company. And that is what they have successfully done. And, uh, well, you know, they're living their brand, right, Libby? I mean, Google, yeah. you know, and I, I can say I'm old enough to remember when Google, I actually staffed Google when they were a startup, by the way, on the software side. They have a um, head, you know, they have one of, not, not their headquarters, they have a, a, a strong office here in, in Cambridge where I am, and I was just at Google uh, a number of weeks ago and ate lunch and met with their teams in their cafeteria, and I, I, I just never seen such a company that year after year after year, again, when I remember them when they were a startup, I know them now, and they're still innovating. You should see their cafeteria. You should see people walking around there. I mean, they've got ahi sushi and, you know, soba noodles, and they really work on workplace, workplace culture. It, 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 it's part of their existence. They're very creative about, you know, you walk through the halls of Google Cambridge, and it's creative. There's places for people to hang out with their laptops and iPods, and they're making it all happen for employees, you know? And I think they've been a wonderful case study from that perspective. Well, just, of, and just as, just as Google um, disrupted um, Yahoo, and now Facebook has right. disrupted Google. So, I, right. you know, it's interesting to see, but what I learned um, as that began to happen to me, and as I, I was living in that world because Yahoo disrupted many other companies when we came into the uh, mix. And uh, one day I was in the Silicon Valley having dinner with a bunch of chief human resource officers and uh, the head of HR for Google was there. And I said, oh, I'm so mad at you. You're stealing all of our employees. And then somebody said to me, well, I'm so mad at you. Uh, I'm st you're stealing all my employees. And then someone at the end of the table said, well, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. So uh -huh. we viewed ourselves <laughs> right. as, uh, as all stealing from each other, but the point is, it's not going to be just about stealing from each other. It is actually going to be a challenge. It is, I will say right now, to get the best and the brightest to even want to come to work for a corporation. Now, at the same time we have social media, we can beat that to death, but I think the key point that we should make about that is every worker over the age of um, 32, let's say, will always have their profile online. So they will be able to be found. They will be able, you know, accessible to their network. And so the assumption for a company is all of your workers are being recruited at every minute. Used to be you could kind of hope that they were happy and they could sit at right. their desk and work and they would have to type up that resume we described. But workers can find out anything they want about your business and who um, works there and whether they're a good boss or a bad boss. They can use tools like Glassdoor and others to find out how much to make. Uh, they can look on YouTube and find out the employee experience. Um, and um, so you can't control the message anymore. You have to provide the experience that uh, is attractive to workers. And I'm not just talking about um, um, generating... Soba, no soba noodles in the cafeteria? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you've run across Sasha Chua, have you, Megan? Have you met her? Who? Sasha Chua. She's on my next slide. But um, oh, okay. see, I met her. I met her at an event at Google. But um, right. it's a very interesting story. I met her about five years ago, and she's from Canada. A young woman. I think she was probably twenty-six when I met her. So she's early thirties now. But she was. Uh, in technology, then went back to get her master's degree and started this great blog called Living an Awesome Life. And she had all these talents. And if you read her online resume, she has 50 things she's good at. It's just crazy. But the good the story about her is she was out there telling her stories, and IBM approached her, an mm -hmm. old company that's been around a long time, and said, come to work for us. And they let her create her own job, carve mm -hmm. out her own job, and she was an evangelist for Web 2.0. She was a mentor right. to right. older IBM people. But she was able to stay there only about four or five years. 
before she went out on her own um, because the corporate life still didn't fit her needs. But the story that I tell about her is she's the ultimate consumer of work because she created her own brand and was found and hired and she made her mark on IBM and then was able to move on to her next stage in life that she wanted to um, be in in terms of a career. Well, I will say so, IBM, another one of my former clients, by the way, staffed them up as well. And I will say they're on my list of companies who have done a very effective job of turning around their brand to look more new school, um, to become, um, you know, embracing the idea of employees getting social and blogging. Um, and, and they've been living it. I've been very impressed with, with IBM, actually, and how they've been able to um, really express their employer brand in a way that seems genuine in social media, by the way. You know? Well, they were, they were very much hurting because yep. um, when, when Google started to steal everybody from Yahoo and Microsoft, Yahoo and Microsoft, to, to steal everybody from IBM, and IBM realized we have got to change. And I think they've done a very good job. Yep. They're the ultimate company that re has reinvented itself time and time again, including Agreed. what business they're in. And so yep. that's my example of how somebody did it right. But I could give yeah. you a lot of examples of I think that's a great example. Done it right. Uh, and right. at the same time. Um, I am officially um, hungry. Thank you, Megan. And I'm also officially uh, scared. I mean, what, what can companies do about this? There's a talent war going on. You just said, Libby, every employee is being poached and recruited 24-7 through social media and uh, LinkedIn and all these different channels. What can companies do? What, what, what's going on? What is this employer branding and how can they actually affect and win this talent war? Well, um, let me move forward to a couple of slides to answer your question so we don't get ahead of ourselves. But you really need to answer the question for people, what's in it for me? So I move forward to that. But what I think uh, the best opportunity we have is our own corporate brand. And not every company has a great brand, so they're going to need to be working on that first. And then within that, that then they need to look at their work experience and make the work experience a well-branded work experience. Now, what I mean by that is um, well-branded is you work for a brand that stands for something, you believe in that brand, and you want to be a part of it. That's one side of well-branded. The other side of well-branded is when I put that brand on my profile, or I put that brand as I'm a member of that brand on Facebook or LinkedIn, um, that brand is, quote, unquote, Facebook worthy. People say, wow, you work for a cool place. And that is what this top talent is looking for. Now that doesn't mean that they've stopped looking for the next opportunity. And um, I can tell you I have several friends at Google who are still there, but they're always looking for that next thing. Um, they're also looking to be recognized for what they do, rewarded for what they do. But more important, we all want that. They want to make an impact. They want to see that their presence within that brand makes a difference. And they also want to have people that they can learn from. They want to have a culture that enhances their experience every day. And they want to feel that they're part of a socially responsible organization. So these are the, the key elements. The, the problem is that takes a lot of work. And not yeah. everybody focuses on it. So it, and it's going to become a priority, and it will. In the trend right now, it's becoming a priority because of retention problems. It's easy to recruit uh, talent into your company, right? Hey, you know, I, we, we I, offer these eight things, but you have to live it. And believe me, new recruits know about ninety days in if, if companies and leaders aren't living their brands, and they will move. They don't stay. So, so wait. So okay. So we. That's a good point. So employer brand and consumer brands have to be aligned in some way, shape, or form, right? Like if I, if you tell me this is a great place, you recruit me, I sure. jump into the company, three months into it, I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. They don't have an uh, employer. See, they don't have not, o not only that, Rob, your employers, the employees are going to blog about it. So now we have a triple effect going on of not only are they not happy, but they're blogging about how unhappy they are in this particular workplace culture. 
Okay, so say, leader, uh, leaders hiring take, people, beware. Yeah, it doesn't take 90 days. No, <laughs> Most no it, could take, it, it could take 24 hours. They, yeah. they find out before they even go on the interview. That's the sure. bad thing. And, sure. um, yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's the point. And back to the, you, you said the, the most important thing there, the old school thinking was we have this big brand that we advertise to our customer, buy our product, here's what we stand for, it's wonderful. And then we have these millions of little people creating the product, but there's no connection between the two of them. They're just working, hey, they need a paycheck, they'll do it. That's not the way it is anymore. Your people who are creating that product uh, must be completely aligned with that brand. That must be an authentic, seamless um, experience between creating the brand and delivering the brand promise to the customer. And um, those people who work for you, whether they're employees, workers, or even those people who do um, small tasks that you know we talked about earlier, um, that is um, all got to be around this whole brand idea. So um, we have to totally change the way we think. Uh, some small examples are on this slide. Um, we, we can't think about jobs and promoting jobs. We have to think about our whole workforce and plan for a holistically for that. We have to think about what kind of experience we want to create for workers. We need to think about what segments of workers are important and invest in the most valuable segments more than we do others. And I think this is really key. Um, like Rob said, uh, we need to uh, focus on not promise people you're going to work here for 20 years, but promise them what they will gain in value for being here while they are here. And stop trying to build loyalty and start working on people who are engaged with the brand and productive. It's almost like you're you're turning the the tide and saying we're going to under promise and over deliver, and how we're going to do that is via behaviors, right? You know? Whether it's leadership behaviors, employee behaviors, wow, that job description that was out there in the universe or the blogosphere, it actually does match up with my experience as an employee the first ninety days here, you know. And wow, you know, no one workplace is perfect. But it's about representing that both at the front end of the recruiting process, whether that's a job description or your recruiter uh, conversations, uh, you know, in-person interviewing, you name it, the list goes on. But it's got to match up. It's got to be authentic. It certainly doesn't have to be perfect. And I think that's the best message we can be sending to companies who want to humanize their brand is to say it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be thought of um, in a way that, resonates when people are interviewing at your company for starts. Well, and I would say, Megan, I wouldn't even have a job description. Yeah. I would just go have an yep. experience that clients sure. can have. And I sure. think it was, I may have been you, Megan, or, or Rob, who said a few minutes ago, oh, it's easy to hire people. The interesting thing, and it would be interesting to poll our audience if we could um, do that, is, is it really easy to hire people? Yes, there's a lot of people looking for work. But even um, the most uh, regular jobs out there, this is a, a survey I have up here from Manpower, of the 10 most difficult to fill jobs. And these are regular jobs. These are not you know, some rare talent. But what we have right now is we have a high expectation by organizations of finding the most perfect person for every job because there's so mm -hmm. many people out there. And we have so many people out there that don't match that description perfectly. And so most of the employers that I've talked to in my work are reporting that it's very difficult to hire the right people. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon in the middle of this whole um, issue. And that's created by the fact that there's just a mismatch of talent all over the world in right. terms of what is needed and what is available. Yep. And how do you describe technicians? I'm just curious. Oh, in in that, man, or how did manpower, I should say, describe technicians? They were um, all the computer type jobs, okay. programmers, the programmers, and, operators, and, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. also people who work on computers. You know, they were all kind sure. of lumped in together. Yeah. 
And, and sales representatives, huh, boy, you know, I was Hello. tweeting with somebody earlier. I mean, somebody said, boy, the, the toughest roles to fill are sales reps. I said, that's been this way for 15, 20 years in this market. Sales reps uh, historically are just very, very difficult to find in terms of, you know, coming in in 30 days and delivering impact. It's, it's I interesting to see how company. much, in, yeah. Yeah, I worked with one company, here, I worked with one company here in Texas, and but what is the you know hardest job to fill? And I was expecting them to say some senior level, whatever. Welders. Yeah. I'm like wow. welders. Uh, because there are, I mean, it's oil and gas era. Yeah. There's all kinds of new um, techniques coming up with scale right. and everything to get new oil. And they don't have these. We they, they don't have enough welders in right. the world. Huh. And it's Go not figure. something you can outsource. Yeah, it's something you right. need somebody who lives there. So this is creating a war for talent, uh, target, targeted talent, and even your most core talent is going to be a challenge or is a challenge if it's not already. And so the talent brand is how you literally use your employer brand to reach out and, and tap this talent. And I think that's the tool that can work the best for you in this situation. Uh, is to have a strong talent brand that aligns with your 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 uh, employer brand. So my next slide sort of goes through very quickly what brands does an organization need. And I think we've already touched on two of these, but your consumer brand or customer brand is what you need to attract customers and what makes people want to buy from you. Your employer brand is what's going on inside the company every day while people are working there. And um, that talks about, you know, how you are as a place to work. And then your talent brand takes that and markets uh, both of those things, the experience you'll have working there, to the segments of talent that you're trying to reach. Because some segments you will want to make more of an investment in than others, because some segments relate more value, value than others. And um, obviously, you can use social media to do that. Um, but now I would like to just kind of leave time for some questions because we're running up on that. So pick my brain there. <laughs> hmm. Well, any questions from the Twitter audience? We have one question. Um, so just to sum up, Libby, what are the top three things that employees can do to align their brand? Employees? Yes. Our employers. Well, actually, so the question on the on the Twitter, on, on the chat is about the employee. Um, it, you know, how how can employees actually align themselves with a brand and and you know, go okay. with the brand? Because I think you mentioned, oh. uh, you know, people want to be associated with cool brands and they want to put on the Facebook. I'm working with my company is Upmo and I want Upmo to be a cool brand, or my company is Google or Nike, right? It, it's so I think what what people are, uh, you know, people want to align themselves to it, but at the end of the day, they don't they don't want to, you know. Um, miss or misrepresent or lose their personal identities, right? Right. Well, so I would say this. I believe that it's the employer's responsibility to really articulate what their brand is so that you can understand it. And if you're, your first clue is if you go somewhere and they can't really describe to you what they stand for and what, what kind of people are going to fit in, you're going to have a problem aligning. So, you know, hopefully they have a, a clearly articulated employer brand that you can understand. And then you have to know yourself and be yourself. And um, then if you know who you are and what you stand for and what you value and what you love and what your own personal mission is, and then ask yourself, how does that measure up with the brand of this company that I'm talking about? And I'll give you an example from my book, HR from the Heart, because people who have read it always laugh about this. But the first job I ever had, I actually got reprimanded because I laughed too loud in the hall. Uh -huh. <laughs> Someone told me, that's so unprofessional, <laughs> laughing so and And when I went to Southwest, I was uh, laughing real loud in the hall early on, and Herb Kelleher, the CEO, walked and said, I just love your laugh. And then that's a small thing, but it's the difference between being somewhere where I fit in that appreciated my laughter 
versus being somewhere where la having fun was not appreciated. And so if having fun is a core value of yours, and you really like a relaxed atmosphere, then you want to pick an organization that has that same atmosphere. But there's some right. people that are very uncomfortable in that fun atmosphere. So but there's, there's never a perfect match, right? I mean, you there's yeah. never a perfect match. There's always going to be some things and quirky right. things about yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm a freaking loud mouth, always chatting, talking to people. I, I will not be happy in an environment where everyone's quiet in the queues, right? Yeah. So the challenge, Rob, and, and, and Libby, and the rest of the Twitterverse, and blogospheres, and everybody else, is truly expressing that culture through the interview process. That's what I've been saying when I put on my recruiting practitioner hat. It's, you know, how do we let the world know that, yes, you're going to be comfortable here because you're quiet, or yes, you're going to be uncomfortable here because you like to scream out loud in the hallways. You know, that's the challenge, I think, for companies and, and recruiters and HR pros and leaders to, to really come together and say, let's get really, really, really honest about our workplace culture. And you know what happens? You know, you need several meetings within the teams first before they decide what they're going to put together for what their culture brand is and, and how they're going to, you know, represent that to the public. And that's where I see from my angle, a missing link is, you know, companies want to hire the best and the brightest, and they, they call me and they, they tell me all these buzzwords, but has anyone actually sat down within the halls of that workplace and said, this is what we're experiencing in here, inside the walls first, and then representing your culture brand to the, to the rest of the world? Libby, do you see well, some of that as well, a disconnect well, on the inside before they want to go out? Well, and that, you know, I wrote a whole book on it called yep. uh, Brands from the Inside, um, which yep. tells, it tells you step by step how to go through that and what team to have at the table and what questions to ask and all of those things. And I, it's a lot of work and it's not something that can be done overnight. I think the good news is, is more and more people are appreci um, appreciating this and more and more tools are becoming available. Um, I'm, I'm working with one startup right now called Roundpeg, which allows you to measure you, the candidate, cultural um, atmosphere that you enjoy working in the most with organizations' culture and see if there's a good fit. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, and I've, I've been aware of other startups like that. But right. I yeah. There's, 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 I think, luckily, yeah. there's some, some great new startups that are actually specializing just in that. Yeah, and I just hope HR will use them. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we have two more questions coming in here, that, and then we'll wrap up. So the, the next one is, how can employers recover after their brand has been uh, damaged by poor leadership? Well, I think you have to admit that you have a problem, kind of like step one, admit you have a problem. So when you have a new leader, first of all, the new leader has to be there or leadership has to change because if you have the same leadership that says we screwed up, it's, but we're still here doing the same thing, no one will believe you. But if a new leader comes in and admits that we've had some problems in the past, here's what we've done wrong, and I'm going to make the commitment to do these three things, and then you must deliver on those three things because no one's going to believe you just because you said it in this world. Our employees are skeptical at best and cynical at most. So they are going to want to see the proof that you delivered. And then after you've delivered, you have to tell them, we promised you we do these things, we did these things, and these are the next things we're going to do to move past this. And I think once you have a consistent, um, credible history of delivering what you promised, you have a chance. But if you just go out there and talk and tell about how it's going to be new and nothing changes inside, forget about it. Great, thank you. So the next question is, um, what about the anti-poaching agreements between the big Silicon Valley companies, Apple, Google, and Intel, now being treated as an antitrust case? How does that affect branding when it limits mobility, especially for software developers Ooh, and engineers? That's a great question. Ooh. Is that Kevin W. Big. Grossman's question? <laughs> I believe it is, yes. All right. Well, um, I, I uh, left. Yahoo before all of that happened, so I really can't comment, um, and probably I would be unable to comment if I was still there. 
Uh, but I believe what the situation is is that uh, people believe that that is illegal to do that. So I think, if anything, um, technologists, uh, programmers, and so forth should be able to move at will. And I think that's the atmosphere that will now um, bubble up. But there was such a poaching atmosphere in the valley when I was there that um, I'm sure that people at the top, you know, said, stop poaching my people. <laughs> and I don't think that that atmosphere will continue. Great. Thank you, Libby. So we are actually just about out of time today. So, um, but before we go, you know, please don't forget to visit socialtalentshow.com. Um, to see the latest schedule for upcoming thought leadership shows as well as register um, for them and access previous shows. So we'll also be um, also be sure to follow us on Twitter, um, socialtshow.com and tchat uh, for more disruptive social talent information. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Libby so much for being on today and both of our hosts and hostess, Rob and Megan, thank you so much for your time. And if you have any uh, specific questions in the meantime, please feel free to uh, email info at opmo.com. Please have a great day. Thank you, Libby. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Uh, bye. bye. bye.